Um, David Rowe will talk to us about adventures in modems and uh, recent work. Thanks, Kim. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Rowe. Uh, I'm a ham radio operator and recently have become a bit of a balloon or an apprentice one. And I've been looking at the issues of telemetry, which has got me interested in um, from telemetry with balloons, from telemetry in general, and how open source techniques can be applied to that. So uh, along my way, I've discovered that the, the world is full of chipsets. Um, because I'm a physical layer guy, that sort of means nasty closed source for me. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, what I've been doing in open source telemetry and where I'd like to take it, uh, some early results and our plans for the next year or so. So I guess the basic definition of telemetry I've got is machines talking to machines. Um, in the balloon work that Mark was just illustrating, we have a, uh, a payload sending information to a mapping program and gives us other sorts of information that we need to know to track it. Um, so that's the, the cool application I've been involved in for the last few months, balloon tracking. Um, it's also in, involved in this new thing called IoT and just as a side, what does that mean? <laughs> um, I know it's going to grow insanely, there's going to be 10 billion in the next five years, um, but how many temperatures do I need to know um, and why is it good? So that's a question for you to tell me at the end of this presentation. Um, I get the feeling it's a technology that's waiting for a killer application. Um, so what I like playing is, is in this deep physical layer foo, uh, from the modem beneath, everything beneath the protocol stacks, modems and the actual hardware right down to the radio and antenna. So at the moment I'd argue that we're using closed source telemetry. A lot of it's based on very convenient low cost chipsets that perform reasonably well. Um, now, why do I think these chipsets are a form of closed source? Well, one of the problems is you get those same old limitations. Something goes wrong. I was talking to a friend of mine who does uh, electricity mon uh, monitoring. Um, he can't get a message through from A to B across his house. That's it. You're stuck. There's nothing you can do. You can't get inside that chip. You can't change various parameters uh, that he'd like to play with. That's just as good as it gets. Um, you're limited from improving it, customising it. There's vi limited visibility. There's also some... Um, sort of slightly scary to me attempts to take patents and then build standards around those patents and therefore lock down entire industries to particular companies and their patents. I've seen this happen before in the world of um, digital voice uh, and it's not good. Uh, okay, so why don't we do this next layer down uh, in open source? Um, well, there's a lot of uh, reasons, such as you need hardware, um, there's patents in some cases. It's too hard, we don't have the skills or they can do it cheaper than us. Um, I've heard all this before uh, for the last five or ten years with my digital voice and uh, open source echo cancellation. A bunch of DSP that was only supposed to be done by certain companies with patents on special processes or in hardware, it can all be done with open source techniques. So open source telemetry. The, killer, the key point here is radios are all software now, or they're going that way. Um, so it's all going to move to software defined radio. We as the open source community are really good at software. So suddenly it's entering into a domain that we have expertise in, arguably more expertise than the guys that are selling you those chips when it comes to writing good quality software. Uh, the bit rates for telemetry can be quite low. Um, for the balloon work, we're talking about only 100 bits per second. Now, the amount of processing you need to do in software for a telemetry signal is proportional to the bit rate. Uh, so if it's only 100 bits per second, you only need a little bit of CPU. You can even run these things on a little 8-bit uh, processor, a lot of the signal processing. Uh, say, such as an Arduino, or uh, if you want a little bit more grunt, something like a little ARM3, which come in, you know, several dollar chips these days. So it's kind of applicable to the sort of CPUs um, that we're using already for telemetry. The RF side's challenging, at least for me, uh, but it is doable. Uh, it's not impossible. These radios are not particularly, um, you know, fancy, and the, uh, the building blocks and technology is fairly well known. The performance, this is an important point, the performance is set by physics, not patents, and not particular companies companies. Uh, we get a lot of these things saying this chip does this, this chipset does that. These guys don't control, they don't set the rules. Uh, the rules are set by the universe and we have the same access to those physical laws that they do. Uh, and modems are, are kind of peculiar in that domain. It's one area of science that we can get pretty close to what the universe will allow with the right sort of algorithm. We can do that today, not in 500 years time. And that's pretty rare in sort of engineering. Um, one cool thing is because the modem can be software, it doesn't need very much CPU. So it can be running on the same microcontroller as the payload 
or the little processor that's generally controlling the telemetry. So the little um, IoT processor that's measuring temperature around your desk can also be running the modem software, which is most of the modem signal processing you need. Uh, or the little microcontroller that's on the balloon that's controlling the cut down can also be running most of the modem software. So you get the hardware for free with a little bit of software. And of course the great thing about open source telemetry is we can modify experiment. And I would argue it's best to push down that open source as close as we can to the atoms. Let's not get stuck at one particular layer. So um, I walk the talk. Some early results. Uh, uh, back in November, or I think October, Mark mentioned about an upcoming balloon launch uh, in a week's time. And he um, mentioned that ugly word, patents and telemetry, which was a bit like a red rag to a bull for me. So I had a, a crazy week of hacking away at a new modem and protocol, or processing of protocol, and managed to come up with some improvements in decoding the ancient but useful RTTY protocol that's used for the balloon telemetry. So there were two uh, innovations. I developed a good modem that performed as good as theoretically possible and tested that through simulations. I have a, a background in modem development, so I knew what to do there. Um, and I also tweaked the protocol decoding. There's a lot of known information in the information coming off the balloon, and we could use that to improve it. So without touching the transmitter, just receive side, uh, I developed a new uh, Horus telemetry decoder that significantly outperformed uh, the existing one. The second project I've been working on um, for some of my digital voice work is an open hardware uh, uh, and open software, VHF radio. Um, it's full custom open hardware software with very carefully designed modulation. That is also outperforming many of the current chipsets that are being used in this sort of field. So just a little, I'll say a little bit more about those results. This is the sort of um, ASCII string we get out of um, the current incumbent software we use for decoding the Horus telemetry. Uh, what you can see there is the dollar, dollar, dollars are sort of uh, just signaling this is the start of a telemetry packet. There's a, a ham radio call sign. And then there's meant to be a bunch of um, other information like latitude and longitude, um, uh, altitude. This is right at the limits of where we're decoding telemetry. In some cases in the flight, the balloon may be in an unfavorable position, say straight above our antenna, where it's got poor gain, or it may be uh, on the ground, where we've got a very weak signal. We get pretty poor signals, and this is the line noise that comes out when it's not working too well. Uh, this is, I've adjusted this in simulation form to be just at the point where the systems break. So this is using the incumbent um, Horus decoder, and this is using the new system that I developed. Uh, and I've set the channel to have a packet error rate of about 0.5, which means half of the telemetry, pack telemetry packets are corrupt. Uh, that's where you see the CRC bad, and about half are okay. So with the, the new modem we develop, we get this result, and you can see, even though a lot of the CRCs are bad, that the information is pretty legible. It's human decodable, and uh, most of the time machine decodable. So we took it from this to this, and that's using an identical transmit signal, same signal to noise ratio, but significantly better results. Uh, so very useful open source innovation for balloon telemetry. Uh, I've also been developing a, a prototype radio. I'm new to RF hardware. Um, I haven't really looked at it for, well, proper RF design for about 30 years, never really done it professionally. So I had to learn a lot, had some help from some kind people. Uh, but I've been building a, an open hardware VHF radio and modem right down to all the parts in the electronics. I'm just using uh, you know, regular building blocks, but uh, tuning things to get them work. I do know a bit about modems, so I put a fair bit of effort into making the modem work really well. Um, now you can work out with some maths what the limit is for a certain modem at a certain bit rate. And the limit for this particular modem was around 134 dBm. This is a 1200 bits per second uh, uh, FSK, 2 FSK. That's what the physics says you can get down to. That's as good as the universe will let you do. Um, I achieved that somewhere in that range. My measurement equipment is yeah, not the best, so, but I'm in the ballpark. Now, uh, one popular TI chip uh, that's used for telemetry, same mode, um, same, exactly the same, 1,200 bits per second, 1% errors, that's specified at minus 120. DBM's a measure of power. That's just a tiny amount of power uh, at the receiver input. Uh, the popular LoRa chipset is a little better at a minus 123 dBm for 0.1%. But once again, it's quite a way off theory, which is minus 132. So what do these numbers mean? Well, my modem over the TI one has a 14 dB advantage. That's really significant. Um, I've spent years chasing half a dB in past lives for satellite modems. Um, I nearly burst into tears when I found out these modems were that bad. Uh, and I 
for giving poor Mark a hard time about it uh, ever since. Uh, what it really means is my radio needs 4% of the power to do the same job. Or in other words, these chipset guys are throwing away 90% of the power uh, that they get at their receiver terminal. Throwing a lot of bits, leaving them on the floor. Um, so that's one real solid performance advantage. There are also many other advantages to open source which we're pretty familiar with. Um, so look, we can do better than the chipsets, um, and these guys don't patent physics, um, so they, they have the same limits that we do, ultimately. So where do I want to take this? Well, this has inspired me to, to push down to the hardware. I want to come up with a little you know, postage stamp size module that is fully open source, hardware and software, and can hook up to your existing microcontrollers and give everyone an open source telemetry solution. It's one of my goals for this year and been moving along quite nicely. Uh, this is a block diagram of some of the um, analog um, signal processing components. Um, the key point here is right at the end, after the baseband amplifier, it goes to the ADC of your existing microcontroller. So we're going to, most, and most of the work is going to be done on that microcontroller. A little bit of RF hardware, most of it in software. So that's the idea. Uh, and this is a workflow diagram for the project that shows where we're at at the moment. Uh, the first thing we developed over the last few months was an Octave uh, FSK modem. Octave is a signal processing simulation language that's just convenient for developing things like modems. Uh, but then usually when you want to run it on a real platform, pl platform you port the code into C. Um, that's been done. This next one has just been recently done as well. Next step is to get the C code into fixed point. These little microcontrollers don't have an FPU. Um, fortunately, this particular modem is, works quite well in fixed point. That can be a struggle with some algorithms. Fixed point just means we have integers instead of floating point numbers. Uh, and then integrate on a small microcontroller. Uh, we've developed a telemetry protocol. Since that first example I've shown you, Mark and I have been working together to progressively improve the telemetry protocol we're using for Horus. That has applications in other uh, telemetry applications. It's got forward error correction and a few other features, variable uh, block lengths, so it can be used for many other applications. Uh, we need to prototype the, the uh, radio hardware, PCB layouts, and integrate the whole thing. But, uh, and it'll end up being a you know, tiny little module that you can use for telemetry. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Microphone, there's a question there. We need the microphone to go around, I think. Thank you. Um, have you looked into or figured out some of the maybe key reasons your solution performed very well, or were there, is that just good design, or is it in some part, you know, more expensive components, or was there any key thing that really stood out as you know, um, other things? I don't know doing? what's quite, say, inside the chips, with respect to the chipsets, you mean? I don't, yeah. I don't quite know what's going on, but everywhere else I look at crappy modems. Right. People aren't taking the care and they're not um, developing and testing the modems carefully. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. Yeah. Uh, so when you convert from uh, octave to C and then fixed point, is that all tedious manual crap? Or Yeah. Yeah, oh, all right. <laughs> But, but you can, um, we do things like we have a unit test in Octave that dumps a bu bunch of the internal vectors, and then in the C code we dump those same vectors, automated tests to make sure they're within one part in a thousand, and make sure the bit error rate's identical, and matches the theoretical performance. So it's tedious once, and then it's not too hard to make mods from then on. Uh, just on his question, so you said that the modems were mostly crappy, so do you think that the advantage was on the hardware or on the software side? Sorry, the? The advantage which you took is uh, as I said, I don't know entirely what's going inside. The, it could be things like noise factor in the uh, noise figure in the receiver, things like that. I don't know entirely. But in the, the ones I have looked at, like the Horus, it was just bad modems. Okay. Mm. So the applications you've got at the moment, it's quite low bit rates. Um, what sort of microcontroller would you need to scale it up to sort of tens to hundreds of kilobits? Something like an ARM 3 or 4 running at a couple hundred megahertz. Still in the sub $10 range for the CPU. And it can also do all your analog sensing and a bunch of other things as well, like running your payload. Mm -hmm. We're planning on flying a yeah, 100 kilobit uh, Horus payload sometime in the next few months. Mm -hmm. the, all the C code's scalable, you see. No limitation. Or you just, when you initialise it, you tell it your symbol rate and your sample rate. Yeah. 
Is this the same uh, modem and technology that you used with the uh, free DV and the Codec 2 implementation? No, actually, this or? one's moving into the VHF space. The, the HF modem I'd done for free DV was designed for the HF channel, which is actually a lot nastier. Um, the reason you can get by with 10 milliwatts on these channels is it's near what's called a perfect um, additive white Gaussian noise channel. It's a textbook channel, which is why you can go 300 kilometres on 10 milliwatts. HF's got nasty multipath, and there's not too much of that on this. A little bit of fading when the thing's twirling or directly above you, that's all. Also, just one more, one more question. Sorry. Um, how critical, in terms of um, RF design, um, you know, I've worked with some high speed digital designs, and once you start operating at high speeds, you know, they start operating like RF circuits as well, and you can end up with all sorts of funny things happening. Yes. How, how critical is the PCB layout to the, to the success of the design? Most of the signal process is going to be inside a single microcontroller that has no external buses, so it'll be reasonably quiet, I would say. Yeah. But it is definitely a concern. Modern clock speeds, they can emit well into the VHF spectrum. Mm. Um, David. If I understand it correctly, you've achieved the same signal-to-noise ratio with 4% um, power compared to a dedicated hardware chipset, but is there a penalty in the overall power budget associated with running a software modem compared to You mean to such a... as DC power input? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know at this point because I haven't optimised that part of the hardware or gone there. Could be. Uh, we're currently looking at appropriate parts to build the prototype radio hardware, and we'll do it in stages. You know, I don't have a silicon foundry, but I can get the, block, you know, the building blocks right and uh, move from there. What would be lovely is, and I think this will happen, is one day someone brings out a microcontroller with a little radio deck that's fully open and custom, just a synthesizer and some, some mixers, but hooked up to everything yeah, inside. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'll happen. It's natural evolution. Mm. Any further questions? One, yep. Um, where, where's the code? Can we, are we able to, is that up anywhere as yet? Have we not yeah, had a sure. Chance? If you just Google all your modems belong to us, there's cool. a series of blog posts on this sort of stuff. Awesome. And it's all uh, open source, both the Octave simulation code, so you can run all simulations, and the real-time C code. Anyone else? Oh, two more. <laughs> Hi David, have you packaged this into anything formal? I oh, mean, no. not hardware package, but software package. Oh no, I'm not very good at that sort of thing, yeah. <laughs> but if someone would like to do that, that's fine. There's just basically SVN check out and you get head and maybe it'll work that day. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told it has to be done though, but not by me. Hmm. So you said that the C code is on your website? How about the radio hardware schematics? Are there also over there? Or? Uh, we don't have a hardware schematic for this radio, but for the other radio I'm doing, the um, SM2000, yep, that's all up on... Uh, the SM, if you just Google SM2000, yes, there's okay. schematics, and we're in the middle of printed circuit board layout for that one as well. Okay. And a bunch of blog posts on the development. Because okay. I was new to it, I felt compelled to uh, talk about it. Mm. Is this going to work on ISM band, David? Um, we're going to make it programmable. So whatever you've got a license for or a game to have a go at. Mm. Uh, David, it's obviously optimised for telemetry, but as just far as pushing bits, say someone would want to do a, a low-rate video stream using this, how, how would it go doing those sorts of things? Yeah, we're hoping to try something like that in the next few months. The C code's just, when you're in it, in it, the code, the first thing is you say, what's, this, what's your bit rate and what's your sample rate? And then it'll just push bits through it. It doesn't really care. So uh, you just need to think about how you're going to modulate that or the, the radio deck and things for those applications. At the moment, we're doing the modem is running on a laptop with the sound blaster hooked up to a, a ham UHF radio. But eventually, we'll need to go to uh, RF decks that can handle all that sort of thing. In particular, on a, a balloon, we need something tiny that's uh, probably custom made. And that's one of our challenges for the high bit rates come up with a a deck that can do that. Hmm. 
All right, if you'd like to thank David. Thank you.